Hi, everybody. Um, I hope that you can all hear me. I am Liza Makowski at UNC Chapel Hill. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Nutrition. And today I'm going to talk about obesity, weight loss, and the microenvironment in basal like cancer, basal like breast cancer. And I just want to welcome you to type in your questions and I'll read them out at the end and answer as many questions as I can. And I also want to mention that this is a CME accredited talk. So there should be a little button on your screen that if you want to get credit for this, you can do that also. So um, many people study the genetics of cancer, but today I'm going to talk about some non-genetic contributing factors. And what I'm going to specifically speak about is the role of diet and obesity in breast cancer. So we know that obesity is a major problem in the United States. Um, and if you look at this little map, the, um, this shows the prevalence of obesity and obesity is measured by BMI, um, body mass index greater than 30. So if you look at the darker colors, that means there's a high percentage of the US that is obese. And um, we know that there are many complications of obesity. And in my lab, we study diabetes, heart disease, and um, breast cancer. So the major take home point I want you to remember from today is that obesity is a modifiable um, risk factor for breast cancer. So why do I study breast cancer? My background is in obesity and macrophage biology and um, inflammation. But it's really interesting that obesity um, is very similar to um, some of the effects we see that might cause breast cancer because the breast is also a big fat pad we see very similar um, effects. So what I'm gonna talk about today is a collaboration between myself and Melissa Troster, also here at UNC, and a project that we have funded by the NCI and NIEHS called Pregnancy, Obesogenic Environments, and Basal-like Breast Cancer. And th then at the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our work um, in collaboration with our community partners through the Center for Emi Environmental Health and Susceptibility. So, um, what we're interested in is our hypothesis is that there, there's different windows of susceptibility. So throughout lifetime, there are different periods of the life when a woman might be more susceptible to risk factors that can cause breast cancer. So the area that we focus on is the adult period and the postpartum period where we have normal tissue remodeling and where we look at the effects of obesity and also the contribution of the microenvironment. So I'll get into what that means. So we know that breast cancer is the number one diagnosed breast cancer in women and the, the second killer of women. So this is a huge problem and we need to find um, risk factors and modifiable risk factors to prevent it. We also know that this is a huge problem worldwide. So as I mentioned when I started, many people look at um, genetic factors that cause breast cancer. And we know that family history or genetic risk factors can account for about 5 to 15% of breast cancer, especially the breast cancer genes like BRCA1 and BRCA2. But that means that about 85% of breast cancer is not related to family history. So why is that? So there's lots of other risk factors. Being a woman, getting older, um, race and ethnicity, your re reproductive history, lifestyle, as I'll talk about today, environment, and then known risk factors like radiation. So today I'm going to talk about something that we do at UNC as part of our um, Breast Cancer and the Environment Research Program, or the BSERP. We're going to focus on race and ethnicity, reproductive history, and obesity. So what do I mean by weight and obesity? So when you talk about obesity, we need to consider the type and the timing or the windows of obesity. So is there a weight change from adolescent to adulthood or from early adulthood to late adulthood? Um, can we categorize by pre-menopausal obesity or post-menopausal obesity? Because after menopause, the estrogens decrease, um, um, ovaries decrease estrogen production and we could get estrogen production from adipose tissue. So we need to really consider the different types of obesity and when obesity might affect risk. And the other thing we really need to think about is considering different subtypes of breast cancer. So what do I mean by breast cancer subtypes? So when you get a diagnosis of breast cancer, a biopsy is taken and immunohistochemistry is performed and that looks at different proteins in your um, biopsy, the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, or the HER2 new um, 
epidermal growth factor. So this can help categorize um, the type, the subtype of breast cancer you have and um, certain treatments you may get. But then about 15 years ago, Chuck Peru, um, who's also at UNC, has defined something called breast cancer intrinsic subtypes. So these are subtypes defined by gene expression, not protein expression. So using microarrays, um, uh, uh, about 15 years ago, Chuck looked at, he was able to group different breast cancers and they um, grouped in different subtypes. There's about five subtypes represented. And these have been studied intensively over the past years. And the one I'm highlighting with the arrow is basal-like breast cancer. That's what I'm gonna talk about today. So let me just quickly review a little bit about the mammary gland and the milk duct, because some of the terminology comes from um, the types of cells. So if we look at the mammary gland, um, we can see that there's luminal cells here, I'm putting some arrows near that, and then myoepithelial cells. And then we have um, some of these are called basal myo myoepithelial cells. So the milk is secreted out this way, and these basal myoepithelial cells actually can help push the milk out. So they kind of have a um, um, myocyte, can have a myocyte phenotype also. So let's get back to the, the subtypes. If we look at the subtypes, they're categorized as um, luminal A, luminal B, HER2, or unclassified. And you could see, if you look at the pie chart, luminal A actually comprises 44% of um, all breast cancers. So that's a large percentage. And a lot of times, even in the breast cancer field, when you see a talk, people will just say breast cancer in general. And that's just statistically referring to luminal A, just because there's more um, prevalence of luminal A. But what I'm gonna talk about today is basal-like breast cancer. So you, we see that highlighted in bold. There's, it's ER negative, PR negative, and HER2 negative. So um, basal-like breast cancer is known as a triple negative hormone receptor um, uh, cancer. What that means is that there's no specific drug therapies. It's known to be highly uh, high-grade cancer, aggressive with poor survival. There's a short survival time after metastases. Um, it's very prevalent in young women and also in African-Americans. And the etiology remains unknown. And that's why we're investigating this particular subtype. And what's really interesting is that obesity is a risk factor for both pre- and post-menopausal um, basal-like breast cancer. So I'm gonna get into that in a little bit more detail. So breast cancer has complex relationships with obesity. If we look at epidemiological data, we see that um, some early, early studies showed that obesity does not, I'm highlighting, does not increase breast cancer risk in premenopausal women, but obesity did increase uh, breast cancer risk in postmenopausal women. But this was before we had um, careful categor categorization of subtypes. And again, um, more recently showed weight gain affects breast cancer in postmenopausal women. So for a long time, people thought that premenopausal obesity was not a major concern. But until the Carolina Breast Cancer Study and some other studies have, um, have looked very carefully and oversampled minorities, we now see that there's very different relationship with obesity in basal-like breast cancer. So when we look at some data from um, Millikan's paper, when we categorize in luminal A um, and basal-like, we see that the waist-to-hip ratio, with, with an increased waist-to-hip ratio, we see higher odds ratio for risk of basal-like breast cancer. So this means, and other studies have also shown that obesity measured by BMI is associated with risk in young premenopausal women, um, but didn't have effects on luminal. So again, we see different effects on um, breast cancer depending on when obesity is, um, is prevalent. So there's a lot of misconceptions. Premenopausal obesity has no effect or slightly decreased risk of breast cancer. So yes, that statement is true if we consider overall breast cancer, which again is mainly represented by luminal because that's the most prevalent subtype and it's most associated with postmenopausal obesity. But that statement is false if we consider premenopausal obesity and postmenopausal for basal-like breast cancer. So we need to remember that basal-like breast cancer um, is associated with obesity before and after. If we turn to mouse models, um, there's lots of studies out there showing that obesity can increase 
breast cancer, um, the tumorigenesis. But most of these um, have, are in luminal A type models. Prior to our recent work, there have been no stu studies examining the effects of obesity on basal-like breast cancer using genetically engineered mouse models. So we turned to mouse models to look at obesity and breast cancer. And again, um, Chuck Peru and Hershkowitz did um, some microarrays and actually compared human tumors to um, many different mouse models. And we see highlighted in red basal-like tumors. And one mouse model co um, uh, localized very closely to the basal-like tumors, and that's the C31 tag mouse. It's a, so it's most, it resembles basal-like tumors in humans. And I'll tell you a little bit about the C3 tag mice. So this is a um, T antigen expressing um, transgenic mouse model. So the T antigen um, blocks tumor suppressors to induce tumor, uh, tumors. It has characteristics of basal like breast tumors, BRCA1 deficiency, P P53 mutations or deficiency, high expression of certain keratins and P cadherin. What's really important about this is that the mice, the mouse model has intact stroma. We don't need to do surgery or xenografts or any kind of um, clearing of the fat pads. We don't need any chemicals or hormones to induce tumors. Um, so 100% of the mice get tumors. So what we want to look at is how obesity affects breast cancer in this mouse model. And our hypothesis is that obesity can induce alterations that create a permissive microenvironment. So if we look at this little model, between postnatal, pubertal, and premenopausal adulthood period. And if we see this cartoon of the normal mammary gland, we see um, changes or remodeling along, and the dashed line indicates postpartum remodeling. But with obesity, we propose that there's defects or alterations in these um, modifications that happen over time. So perhaps there's sustained modifications or remodeling of the tissue. Perhaps there's um, lots of modifications if you're obese in puberty or later in life or early in life. So um, we wanted to model that in our mouse model by looking at first adult windows of susceptibility. We used our um, C3 tag mice and we um, exposed these mice in adulthood after puberty to either low fat diet or high fat diet. These um, mice gain weight and, and we observe tumor incidence. And after we see the tumor, we palpate for tumor and sacrifice after three weeks. And along the way, we characterize metabolic parameters because we're interested in obesity and other risk factors. We measure tumor outcomes, and then we focus on the normal mammary gland and tumors. So this work was published, and I'm um, focusing on my uh, postdoc Sneha Sundaram and some of the other members of my lab who helped contribute to this paper. So we showed that obesity or high fat diet exposure can induce obesity. We see increases in body weight in the mice fed the 60% diet and a doubling of fat mass by MRI. And our findings were that obesity blunted latency. So we saw a faster tumor onset. So in the red line, looking at the tumor free time, um, we see that there, the tumors in the high fat diet fed obese mice came on sooner. So there was a shorter time to tumor. And we did not see changes in tumor burden or tumor pro progression that were significant. Um, so just to summarize some data, we saw no changes in glucose. We saw no changes in insulin or HOMA, no changes in estrogen or progesterone in the plasma. We looked locally if there were changes in aromatase in the mammary gland, and in fact, we saw no aromatase at all expression, so um, no aromatase in the mammary. Um, we did look at systemic inflammation and local inflammation. We did see a significant increase in TNF-alpha in the plasma, but no change in IL-6 or MCP-1, other commonly regulated um, cytokines and chemokines with obesity. And then we looked locally using Luminex in the mammary glands and tumors and saw no changes locally. So this brings us back to the microenvironment and what is obesity doing? So this is a little cartoon modified from Mina Bissell. Mina Bissell was a pioneer in the field looking at the role of the microenvironment. And if we look at this little graph, we see um, on the y-axis barrier to cancer formation and tumor genesis over time. 
And we see at the top how the microenvironment can blunt or promote tumorigenesis. So when we have a healthy microenvironment, we're blunting tumorigenesis. But something switches, there's some barrier that gets um, crossed. And then we have a permissive environment. So then we kind of allow tumorigenesis to occur. So if we think back to the normal fat pads, so in adipose tissue, we know that there's, there's um, expansion of the adipose tissue. There could be um, stress in the adipocytes. Hypoxia can happen. We could have inflammation happening, so lots of changes. And um, we've actually shown that um, tumor, tumor um, and stroma crosstalk is important in the mammary gland. And some of the factors that we've investigated are growth factors and adipokines that can be upregulated with obesity that I'm listing here in our little table. But what I'm going to focus on today is the role of fibroblasts in this microenvironment, and specifically the role of a growth factor called hepatocyte growth factor. So um, a lot of this work has been done in collaboration with Melissa Troster, who's right here, my collaborator um, in the epidemiology department at UNC. She's done a lot of in vitro modeling of um, human cell lines and human primary um, samples. And so what they do is they look at epithelial monocultures from luminal and basal-like breast cancers. And they also look at fibroblasts in monoculture. And then what they do is direct co-culture. And they look at um, different mixes between the fibroblasts and luminal breast cancer cells or basal-like breast cancer cells. And what they've seen is dramatically different patterns when you co-culture fibroblasts with these different cell lines. So we see that basal-like has a very different pattern than luminal breast cancer cells. And so in, in, many, in many publications I've indicated here, um, we and the Troster lab have showed that basal-like breast cancer is characterized by, by unique stromal epithelial interactions. So this is a little cartoon showing that um, if we look at um, some epithelial, uh, common epithelial cell line, these are called the MCF10A series. So they progress from normal epithelium, hyperplasia, to ductal carcinoma in situ. And we see as these cells become normal to more aggressive, we see increased um, growth factor. And this was published by um, Patricia Casvas Hernandez in the Truster lab. So um, more work from our lab and others has shown that the HGF, hepatocyte growth factor, and its receptor CMET are important in basal-like breast cancer. So in humans, we have high expression of CMET, which has co correlated significantly with basal-like breast cancer. And um, in mouse models, in basal-like breast cancer, the CMET locus is amplified uh, with elevated signaling. And the Troster lab has also shown that 86% of basal-like breast cancer patients express an HGF signature. So let me just show you that data for a minute. This is from Patricia Casbas hernandez in the Troster lab, and they looked at um, they um, looked at the different tumor subtypes and the HGF signature. So what they found was that basal-like tumors were very highly positive for the HGF signatures, whereas the luminal um, were not, and, the, and other subtypes were not. So that suggests that HGF cement signaling is important in basal-like breast cancer. And then they correlated that with survival. So you see in basal tumors um, on the left, that uh, the probability of survival was much worse if the, if the samples were HGF um, positive, if they expressed the signature. That was not true in other um, tumor subtypes like luminal A that I'm showing here. So this really speaks to the fact that um, basal-like breast cancer is specifically, potentially, um, the role of HGF CMET is important in basal-like breast cancer. So we wanted to turn to our mouse models and focus again on the normal microenvironment and also the tumors. So again, we, looked, we used immunohistochemistry to look at HGF CMET in our um, mouse models, and we scanned our slides with an Aperio scanner that we have in our lab and did quantitative analysis. And so we looked, we confirmed that um, HGF is indeed expressed in our fibroblasts and um, less so in our tumors. And we looked at um, the HGF CMET pathway and then some of the downstream effects, because this is a very carcinogenic pathway. Um, interestingly, it's, it's involved in normal breast um, remodeling throughout development, 
but also breast um, carcinogenesis because it can perform extracellular matrix remodeling, induces growth, induces motility, um, induces angiogenesis, and is anti-apoptotic. So our hypothesis that is, was, was that HGF CMET signaling could mediate epithelial stromal communication during cancer progression. So indeed, when we looked at our cancer model, we found that in mice that were um, in black, the 10% fed, or 60%, the um, obese mice, we saw increases in HGF expression with obesity, CMET expression with obesity, and phospho-CMET, so activation of CMET signaling in our normal mammary gland, in our normal mammary gland. Um, we also found um, especially a, a doubling of the CMET receptor in tumors. And so we wanted to then see, at the time we didn't have any tools to test the HDF CMET pathway. So we wanted to model um, in vitro some um, using cells derived from our mice. So we were able to isolate mammary gland and tumor, and we um, chopped up those uh, tissues and isolated fibroblasts. So we isolated normal associated fibroblasts and cancer associated fibroblasts. So the CAPs came from the tumors and the NAPs came from the mammary gland. And what we did with those is we co-cultured them. We took our NAPs and our CAPs and co-cultured them. Um, and for, well, sorry, before cold culture, we first looked at the um, media to see what's, what's happening with HGF. So we performed uh, just simple ELISAs and looked at um, HGF secretion over time. And we saw that um, in our mice that were obese in the red and in the mice that were in the, in the fibroblasts that were derived from um, the tumors, the caps, we saw an elevation of HGF secretion with um, obesity compared to the lean and with cancer cells compared to the normals. So our cultured fibroblasts isolated from obese mammaries and tumors secreted more HGF. And then here's where we did the co-culture. Um, we, we first confirmed that um, using conditioned media that indeed that we could see signaling of the CMET pathway. So if we looked at CM conditioned media from our cells and a positive control of recombinant mouse HGF, we saw that we could indeed induce phospho CMET signaling. And then we looked at um, tumor cell proliferation. So we used a 4T1 epithelial cancer cell line here, and we used conditioned media. We have our positive um, and uh, negative controls here. We saw induction of proliferation. And when we used um, conditioned media from our NAPs and our CAPs, we saw that in the obese, um, uh, the fibroblasts isolated from obese, uh, tumors, the CAPs, um, induced the most amount of proliferation in our tumor cells. And then we wanted to see what happened with um, proliferation and cell migration, and we used something called a scratch test. So this is where you create basically a wound or um, an area for the cells to migrate into. So what we did was we fluorescently labeled our cancer cells, the 4T1 cancer cells, and we co-cultured them with NAPs and CAPs. And you could see, um, we looked at, uh, we're gonna look at HGF effects, specifically by using a blocking antibody. So here's a, um, a picture. We used um, um, microscopy and looked at the cells over time. And we just took a snapshot here to show you. And it's very detailed. You don't need to pay too much attention, but you could see the fluorescent cells. And then we, we use blocking antibodies in the caps and the NAPs and it's quantified in the next slide. So when we look at the um, amount of wound closure, so how much did the cells migrate into that center? And we see, again, just like proliferation, the most migration happened in um, when fibroblasts were isolated from obese tumors. And then interestingly, when we used that blocking antibody to block specifically HDF function, we saw a significant and almost total blocking of this migration um, in the cancer-associated fibroblasts from the obese mice. We also saw it in the um, lean mice in cancer-associated fibroblasts. So this suggests that um, HGF was um, playing a specific role in causing cancer, um, cancer cell migration. So in summary for this part, I want, we um, demonstrated that obesity can lead to an early basal like breast cancer onset. So that leads to an 
increased aggressiveness of tumors in this transgenic mouse model. HDF was shown to correlate with tumor onset. Um, we, we saw increased HDF expression from primary fibroblasts in an obesity-dependent way, and fibroblasts isolated from obese um, uh, mice, and especially tumors from obese mice, dramatically regulated proliferation and wound closure, and we showed that in an HDF-dependent way. So what, what were our next steps? So we know that um, obesity was causing the effects, but we were interested in ways to either prevent obesity or reverse obesity or possibly inhibit CMET. So the World Health Organization has um, indicated that body weight and physical activity can account for um, a, a fifth to a third of most of the common cancers, including breast cancer. And so a third of these cancers could be avoided by eating healthy, maintaining normal weight, and exercising. And um, the American Society of Clinical Oncologists, ASCO, just put out a policy statement saying that physicians need to pay more attention to obesity and cancer. And there are epidemiological studies supporting this. There's plenty of studies showing that either prevention of weight gain or weight loss can um, reduce breast cancer risk. Um, and again, getting back to basal-like breast cancer, the Millikan paper um, from the Carolina Breast Cancer Study here at UNC um, estimated, I took this quote, they estimate up to 68% of basal-like breast cancer could be prevented by promoting breastfeeding and by reducing abdominal adiposity. So weight loss. There are studies of weight loss in mice. Um, many studies looking at caloric restriction, um, energy balance, intermittent caloric restriction, and, send, and many data looking at weight loss basically demonstrate that weight loss is also preventative for breast cancer. But none of these studies examined weight loss in a basal-like breast cancer genetically engineered mouse model. And as we learned earlier, this is really important because um, obesity across the span of premenopausal and postmenopausal um, contributes to basal-like breast cancer. So we needed to look at that. Again, we used our same mouse model that resembled human basal-like breast cancer, the C3-tag mouse. And here we did a diet switch study. So we had the mice that remained lean on 10%, mice that were obese on the 60%, and mice where we induced a diet switch at 10 weeks of age. Again, we observed tumor incidence and looked at all the metabolic parameters and tumor outcomes. So first we had to say, did these mice lose weight? So we were, um, when we induced the diet switch at 10 weeks, we indeed, we indeed did see a significant um, uh, uh, weight loss, and those mice uh, paralleled what we saw in the 10%. So they reduced weight all the way down to the 10% levels. So they reduced weight to lean levels. Same for fat mass. So we looked at fat mass again by MRI, and we see that the mice in the gray that were switched from the obesogenic diet to the lean diet, um, these mice remained lean. And we saw that some of the metabolic parameters associated with obesity and also could be risk factors for breast cancer, the leptin adiponectin ratio was completely restored um, when mice lost weight. That was um, at sacrifice. Interestingly, in this model, we didn't see changes in tumor latency. Um, it might be because these mice were exposed to diet um, for a longer time. This was mice were exposed from weaning. We didn't see changes in tumor latency or tumor number, but what we did see significant differences in was tumor progression. So this is um, showing tumor progression. So when we palpate the tumors, we measure over time for three weeks before we sacrifice. So we're, we're able to measure tumor progression. So we see a percent change or a delta in the tumor volume. So in the obese mice, we see a significant increase in tumor progression that is completely lost when the mice are, are switched to um, lose weight, switch diets to lose weight. Um, some of the other meta metabolic parameters associated with obesity we measured are insulin, um, and then the HOMA score, we see that insulin raises um, with obesity and was restored with weight loss, and same as a measure of insulin resistance. Um, and then I noted down here, we didn't see any systemic changes in cytokines. So the data I've showed you so far is that when we did a longer diet study, a lifelong diet intervention, we showed that a decrease of obesity with weight loss decreased basal-like breast cancer progression. 
And now we wanted to look at the role of HGFC met in that pathway. So um, the reason why we're really interested in HGF is that um, HGFs have been shown in other models to be um, to be increased with obesity. And then this paper showed that when women had um, um, gastric banding where they lost weight, HGF decreased in their serum. So we were excited to look um, um, in the microenvironment. So we focused on the local microenvironment and breast cancer. So when we first looked at the normal memory, and again, we did immunohistochemistry, we saw increases in HGF and CMET like we saw in our, um, the first mouse model. And we saw significant decreases in HGF and CMET with weight loss. When we looked at the tumors, we didn't see dramatic changes um, regulated by diet um, in the tumors um, in HGF, but we saw, again, a significant increase with um, obesity in CMET and a complete reversal um, with weight loss. So in summary, we um, saw that we could reverse some of these findings that obesity induced. We saw um, a reversal of obesity-driven tumor progression. We saw a reversal of many of the metabolic risk factors and a reversal of the HGF CMET um, pathway. So we believe the HGF CMET pathway may play an important role in basal-like breast cancer. And so some of our future studies that we um, recently got funded to perform were to do some CMET inhibitor treatment studies um, and also weight loss studies. So um, one funded by the Mary Kay Foundation is to do CMET inhibition treatment. So once these mice get tumors, we're treating with um, a CMET inhibitor to induce tumor progression. And then we're also really interested in prevention. So can we change or alter that microenvironment in obesity before the tumors are, um, um, are detected? So that's a CMET inhibitor prevention, and that's funded by an NCI provocative question um, and that's just ongoing. So, and there's precedents for looking at CMET inhibitors because there's several clinical trials um, to look at um, CMET inhibitors in breast cancer and also lung cancer. So to summarize our approach, we have focused on the obese microenvironment and basal-like breast cancer. So we know that through epidemiologic studies, um, that obesity and high fat diet can lead to breast cancer risk, but there's a lot of mechanistic uncertainty. So we believe that by focusing on the microenvironment and how obesity can regulate that microenvironment and using um, cross species studies by using human and animal studies, we can approach this um, in a broad manner to find um, risk factors that we can then address. And so, we're really interested in looking at weight loss because we know that that's a modifiable risk factor. We can, we can help or in, um, in, uh, advise people to lose weight. And why are we really interested in this? Uh, there's also a lot of health disparities associated with breast cancer. So if we look at this um, chart and look at um, diagnosis and look at incidence, um, we know that African-American women have lower incidence of breast cancer but they have a higher mortality of breast cancer. So um, they also have a higher incidence of obesity. They also retain more weight after pregnancy. There's decreased breastfeeding. And all of these could be risk factors for um, breast cancer. So if we look again at this Carolina breast cancer study, we look at health disparities um, that were revealed with Carolina breast cancer study and other studies between African Americans, and let me just go through this table. So we see in the red African Americans, and we see pre and postmenopausal women compared to white women that are, again, pre and postmenopausal. And the blue arrows are highlighting the percentages. So if we look at luminal A compared to basal-like, we see a much greater pr um, prevalence of basal-like breast cancer in premenopausal women that are African American compared to um, Caucasian women, and um, postmenopausal African-American women compared to um, Caucasian women. So there's a higher prevalence of um, basal-like breast cancer in African-Americans and especially young African-Americans. So this gets to the other part of our grant. We um, have community partners and we've partnered with the Center for Environmental Health and Susceptibility at UNC 
as part of our grant um, with the BSERP program. And in collaboration with uh, our BSERP um, group, we also have a community advi advisory committee and we work on um, outreach materials. And um, I'm gonna show you a little bit about what we've done there. So what we're hoping to do is translate some of our findings in the lab through our epidemiologic findings and findings in our human studies with Melissa Troster and our mouse findings in my lab into humans. So how do we you know, get this puzzle of individual risk and population risk to help someone understand their risk? So one thing we've done is a focus group study, and this is in collaboration with um, Mar um, Marlon Alacock, Nisha Graves, Kathleen Gray, and Melissa Troster. So um, this was something, it was a focus group study looking at young African-American women and their perspectives on breast cancer. And the findings were really shocking. So um, young African-American women perceived breast cancer to be an older white woman's disease. There was little to no knowledge of subtypes. They wanted more relevant health communication. And they, we actually performed a second focus group um, with healthcare providers and asked a lot of the same questions. And it was actually very surprising to see um, that there wasn't a better knowledge of the subtypes um, in healthcare providers. And that manuscript is in, um, submitted in, in, in preparation and submitted. So um, the last thing I wanna talk about is um, something that we've done is really exciting and I hope that you all can go to this website and I'm going to push that to you right now. It should pop up on your screen. Um, so you don't need to look at it now, I'll just tell you about it. And this is a, um, it's, it's a website to assess your risk. So you, you can assess your health history, diet, exercise, um, and the environment environmental exposures and your health screenings. And then there's lots of um, videos to help you understand risk and why we need to advocate for more prevention, not just treatment. And this was something that was done in collaboration with um, the School for Information and Library Science. And so um, I, I am really excited to um, be able to, to present my data that included our mouse models and also our outreach work and my lab has been phenomenal in um, all these studies. And the, one of the main contributors is Sneha Sundaram, a postdoc in my lab, who's now moving on um, to work for USDA. And um, lots of other members in my lab, Trin Lee and Luma Isaid, have contributed to our manuscripts. And now um, ongoing projects are being undertaken by some doctoral students, Yuan Yuan and Alyssa. So I hope that in the future you can um, See our follow-up studies on um, weight loss and CMET inhibition. And I want to thank my um, collaborators that I believe I've thanked throughout the talk, including mm -hmm. Melissa Troster, Chuck Peru, um, our close collaborators at UNC, the Mouse Phase One Phenotype U Unit, David Dar and Kat Bent, and then our outreach um, collaborators who've been phenomenal in um, um, helping conduct our focus groups and doing our outreach work as well as all the funding, which is extremely important um, to help conduct this research. And so um, I just wanna end by thanking everyone and I'm gonna push to you again, my website. If this is my personal lab website, if you wanted to learn more about my lab and um, I can take some questions now. We have plenty of time because I must have spoken very quickly. So I will open the Q&A. Um, and one, so one question is, does hormonal imbalance trigger this effect? So, um, interestingly, so because, um, basal-like breast cancers are ER negative, usually estrogen does not contribute. So we wouldn't think that estrogen is, um, a strong contributor to this type of breast cancer. However, um, some of our other collaborators have shown that um, estrogen can play a role in um, um, inflammation. And so inflammation can also be important in, in um, breast cancer and basal-like breast cancer. So there is some work about there looking at estrogen and progesterone and um, the induction of inflammation by Sandy Haslam and um, Richard Schwartz. So you can look into some of that. And um, 
second question. Let me see, I have to open this up, okay. Did, did you look for specific mutations related to high level of HGF expression in the fat mice or in genes related to the HGF pathway, um, i.e. the NGF study? So no, that's a really good question. We haven't um, looked into any mutations yet. Um, one thing we have, we thought to look into was um, epigenetic regulation because when we when we were looking at our fibroblast study, we were really interested to see that when we took out the fibroblasts from our obese mice, and especially the tumor associated or the caps, um, they they secreted excess HGF and induced more proliferation and more migration even after being out of the obese microenvironment. So that means these fibroblasts were isolated, frozen, thawed, and then the experiments were conducted. And um, so interestingly, they, they um, appeared to have epigenetic modifications because they, they um, maintained that obese phenotype. But um, we, so first of all, we are looking into epigenetic modifications. HDF is really regulated in a complicated way because it's, um, it needs to be cleaved to be activated. There's um, HGF activator and HGFA, and there's HGF activator inhibitor, HGFAI. So we're looking at all those. Um, However, our weight loss data suggests that at least at the whole tissue level, which is where we did our immunohistochemistry, is that um, we, we don't see major changes. I mean, sorry, we did see major changes with weight loss. So we could um, reverse the obesity-induced effects with weight loss. Um, but that doesn't mean uh, epigenetics might, um, could still be important. And um, some of the mutations we haven't looked at yet. Um, um, I got a nice comment, so thank you for saying I had a nice presentation. And um, one of the last questions, any role in expression of fatty acid synthase in basal-like breast cancer? So that's a really good question. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I, <clears throat> I've contributed to other, other studies that looked at fatty acid synthase and um, lipid metabolism, like in B-cell lymphomas but I don't know about basal-like breast cancer, but um, I could easily look into that in my lab. Um, that's a great question. And I believe that's the end of the questions that I can answer. So um, someone has asked a question I don't know the answer to. So is luminal B always HER2 positive or can it be HER2 negative as well? Um, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I can look it up and get back to you. Um, possibly, I, I don't know if I could email you. I'm gonna mark it as to be answered. So why don't I email you after this is over and, um, and, and I'll get back to you on that. So I think that's the end of my questions and I, Thank, I'd like to thank everybody for attending and appreciate all the time and um, welcome your questions. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.